Very good. Well, James chapter 4, we're going to read. Uh, we're going to start in verse 1. We're going to kind of go through this chapter. Uh, in Sunday school hour, I like to, uh, to just do some uh, overview and, and do some studying of the Word of God. And uh, this is something the Lord gave me uh, a while back that I, I, I've, I've taught a couple different times. Uh, but James chapter 4, we're going to start, uh, start to hear at the very beginning. Uh, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And let's pray and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for the Sunday school hour, Lord, that we can come and learn from the word of God and learn more, uh, Lord, about the word of God and, and learn from this uh, this this uh, chapter here, Lord, just ask that you please would uh, help me, Holy Spirit, to say what you would want me to say, nothing more, nothing less. Pray that, Lord, everybody here would pay attention, Lord, that we would uh, listen and that we would hear, uh, Lord, what you'd have us to hear and that, Lord, we would receive the truth from the Word of God this morning. We love you. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing Grace Baptist Church and just pray that you would bless this morning, bless the morning service to follow as well. Lord, if anybody here doesn't know that if they die that they'd go to heaven, may they get that settled today. Lord, may they make 100% sure. Lord, that if they died, they'd go to heaven, that they'd be with you. Lord, we sure do uh, ask that uh, most importantly, above all else, Lord, that everybody knows they're saved, born again. And Lord, bless the Christians in the room, that Lord, we would be better because of today. And bless, Lord, uh, just the services all day. Bless everything that's done. Bless the music. Bless all that uh, we do, that it would be for your honor and your glory. We sure do love you, Father. And we thank you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, James, uh, we know the book of James was written by James. Uh, we can just start right there. He uh, and, and you look at the in chapter one, James is writing to the churches that are scattered abroad. Uh, you look there. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. So in the book of James is uh, it's 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 a little bit different from like when when Paul was writing. Paul uh, addressed uh, specific churches, addressed the Corinthians, addressed uh, a specific people. He addressed Timothy specifically and Titus. Uh, James is kind of just doing a, is just kind of writing to the twelve tribes that are scattered abroad, and uh, he addresses a problem in chapter four. And we're going to go through the chapter and see a little bit of what uh, what James had to address in this chapter. And then at the very end of the chapter, we bring it all together and kind of see a little bit why, and see what, and kind of bring it bring it all together. But we start in verse one. He says, "From whence come wars and fightings among you?" Well, so we kind of get the idea. There was some wars and fighting. <laughs> They were fighting amongst themselves. Uh, James is uh, getting them to understand they're, they're born again, they're saved, but there's some fightings going on. There's some contention among the brethren. And he says, where does that come from? He says, listen, you've got wars and fightings among you. He says, where, what, what does that come from? What is that a result of? And he says, come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? So he says, fightings and wars and all of the, and, and the contention that's come... It comes from your lust. Look, he says, verse 2, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So he said, there's contention among you. you, you, you there's some disgruntled members in the churches. They, they, they're having problems with each other and getting along. And he says, why is that? He says, because of your lust. He said, you have desires and everybody wants what they want. And nobody's willing to get along because if I can't have what I want, then I'm not happy. Boy, it's true for sometimes as Christians we get to where if we don't get what we want, boy, we're not happy. Amen. We, we have our lusts. We have the things that we desire, that we want to have. And the Bible says that, you know, uh, we know, and, and, and James also addresses lust, that lust is a result. Uh, 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 let me get there. Uh, then when lust hath conceived, you look at verse uh, chapter 1, verse 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so lust is the very beginning, because lust conceives in us, 
and that brings forth sin. What we desire, what we want, uh, you know, our lust, and everybody's different, but what we lust after, what we desire to have above all else, can turn, the Bible says, into sin, and then that sin can turn into death. It brings forth death. And so they were lusting. They had, they had desires that they wanted to have, and they would lust and they wouldn't get. They would kill and desire to have and could not obtain, and then it would bring them to fightings and wars and contention because they couldn't get it. Amen. But that's because when you lust, amen, it never results in happiness. Amen. Your lust never turns into anything productive. Amen. Lust always turns into sin. So we see, number one, the root of the problem. The root of the problem is lust. In a Christian's life, there can be a, there's a lot of problems that come about, but a lot of it become, is a result of just simple lust in our lives. And lust is merely a result of pride. Amen. Pride comes into our lives. We think that, we can, that we're better than God, or we think that we're better than each other, or we think that we can... We can get what we want, and we'll be okay, and we have, we, have a, we have pride in us, and we begin to lust, and that lust turns into sin. And God says the root of the problem for contention, because we know the Bible says pride, uh, uh, that, on, that contention cometh by pride, amen? And that pride is a result of, uh, or that contention is a result of pride, and so is lust. And so we see the root of the problem in the church. They had lust. What was the result of the problem? Well, because of their lust, you see verse 2, they lust and have not. They kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. They fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lust. So they didn't get their prayers answered. Because of their lust, God knew what they were asking. And God says, look, ask and ye shall receive, seek and ye shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. But they did not receive what they were asking for because God knew that they would consume it upon their lust. You know, God does not answer prayer that we ask uh, when we're asking just to because for our own desires. Amen. It's kind of like I can ask the Lord for a million dollars, but Lord, no, I don't need it. Amen. Uh, there's a reason I'm not a millionaire. Amen. That's because Lord knows I would probably not use it for what he would want. Amen. Uh, and, and there are things that in our lives we will ask for, that we will go to God and say, God, I want this. And God says, I don't give it because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. For instance, when you pray and say, Lord, you need to, you need to take care of that guy. That guy's wrong. That guy's got problems. <laughs> the Lord says, look, that's amiss. That's upon your lust. You want God to take vengeance, but God says... Cast the moat out of thine own eye before you take the beam out of thy brother's. Or I think it's the other way around. Brother Donald looked at me. He's like, no, it's the other way around. I just read it this morning, Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 7, I believe. I just read it this morning. But God says, don't worry about everybody else's problem. We're so consumed with praying and asking God, well, we've got, we've got problems with each other. And say, Lord, you need to take care of that guy and take care of that lady and take care of their kids and take care of them because everybody's wrong and they're all... Now, God says, look at yourself. Amen. And God says, a lot of our prayers aren't answered because when we pray, we're just, we're just praying to consume upon our lusts. Amen. So the result of the problem. Then look at verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? God hates adultery, amen. But I believe that God addresses them as adulterers and adulteresses is because... They've turned their back on God. They've left their first love. And now their friendship with the world. Adultery is merely, uh, is the sin of, uh, in, in a marriage, it's the sin of taking somebody else besides your wife. Well, God says, and we know that he addressed the, uh, in the Old Testament, he addressed the, 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 uh, the Jews there. He said, you've committed adultery against me, where they left God and went to the world. Amen. And in our lives, our lust can develop to where we will leave God and develop a friendship with the world and go to the world instead of going to God. And God says that's enmity with God. Because look, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You know, a Christian can become, in a sense, the enemy of God because you take, God, you take the world's side. Kind of like, you know, I'm an American. 
Amen. And I'm an American through and through. But if I go on the enemy's side and I take their side and help out the enemy, I become the enemy of America because I'm helping them. God says when you develop a friendship with the world to the point where you go to the world for your needs and you take the world's side and the world's mindset, you, you take the enemy's side because the world's the enemy of God. The world does everything opposite of God. You can just mark it down. What God says, the world does opposite. God says to love the brethren. The world says hate. God says that it's only through Christ. The world says you've got to work your way to heaven. God says uh, in, in, in other things in the Ten Commandments and all of those things, whatever God says, the world always thinks opposite. And so if we're not careful, our, our, careful, our lust can turn not only into contention among us, but we'll turn to the world for our needs instead of God. We become adulterers and adulteresses, in a sense, against God. That's what America's done. America is in, is in adultery. Because we've turned from God Almighty and trusting in the mighty dollar. We've turned from God Almighty in the public schools, and we've kicked God out of, out of our public schools, with, uh, kicked the Bible out and kicked prayer out, all in the name of equality. Amen. America's in adultery today, and that's why God is judging America the way it is, because America's turned from God. Because America's just wanted to consume ourselves upon our lusts. You walk out, that's what the world's all about. Lust. They want what they want. They've got to have what they want, and if God says they can't have it, they're not happy. How dare God tell me what I can't have? And we become adulterers and adulteresses. But in a Christian's life, that can become so to where if we don't get what we want, we'll turn to the world to get it. Amen. We have to be careful because then we'll become a friend of the world and we'll make the world our friend instead of God because the world will give us what we want. Amen. But like I read Matthew this morning, God will give you what you need. Amen. God will give you what you need. You have needs this morning. God will answer those. But God doesn't always give you what you want. The world will give you what you want. But when it comes to what you need, they'll never be there. Ask the prodigal son. When he left his dad, the world gave him what he wanted. But then when he didn't have what he needed, he was left slopping to pigs. Who did he go back to? Went back to dad. In a Christian's life, you can get what you want from the world, but when it comes back to what you need, you'll always come back to God. Amen. That's why verse 5, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? We can lust so much to where we begin to envy. That's where we begin to take in such a way, and that, and that turns into sin. Amen. Now, but I love verse 6. The resolution of the problem. So we see the root, the root of the problem is lust. The result of the problem was unanswered prayer and at life void of God, where we become a friend of the world. But then the resolution of the problem, verse 6, I love this. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. God has more grace than what you'll ever be able to need. Amen. When you go to God and you say, God, you know I'm wrong. God, you know I need, I, need, I, need, I need your help. God always has more grace than whatever problem that you face. Man, God has more grace to be able to give you what you need. Amen. God will help you overcome sin because he has more grace. God will help you overcome any problem, any difficulty that you face, any wars, any fightings, anything that you have. God has more grace to be able to help you. But God gives it to the humble. That's why it says God resisteth the proud. You can't come to God in pride and ask for the grace of God. God giveth grace unto the humble. God will give you the grace that you need to overcome the difficulty. God will give you the grace to, uh, to ask uh, in, in prayer and ask God for your needs. And God will give them to you through His grace, but not to the proud. We have to be humble. That's why verse 7, 
How do we resolve the problem? We need to go to God. God gives more grace. Then verse 7, we have to submit ourselves, therefore, to God. It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In a Christian's life, we have to learn to submit if we're ever going to resolve the problems in our lives. We have to let pride go and be willing to submit ourselves to God's authority. America has gone to where they think they're above God, and that's why America's in the mess she's in. America needs to get back to, get, to realize we need to go to God and get God's grace on our country, but that means we're going to have to submit ourselves back to God's authority. That means we're going to have to get back to church. It means we'll have to get back to Bible reading. That means we'll have to get back to prayer. We'll have to submit ourselves back to the... Uh, to the authority of God, and resist the devil. Amen. But I love that verse because you resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. Do you have a problem this morning? Is the devil on? Does it feel like the devil's on your tail? Well, submit to God and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I always uh, like uh, my dad used to say, he says, the closer you are to God, the farther away from the devil you be. Amen. You want to get, get away from the devil? Get closer to God. Amen. Then verse 8, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. How do we resolve the problem? We've got to go to God, get God's grace. We're going to have to humble ourselves through submitting ourselves to God's authority. We're going to have to resist the devil. Then we're going to have to draw nigh to God. How do you draw nigh to God? That means you go where God's at. A lot of people say, well, I don't need church. That's where God's at. Amen. I met a guy yesterday. I was out soul and I said, I said, I'd like to invite you to church. And he said, well, you know, you know, he said, I feel like I can have church at my home as much as I can have church anywhere else. You know, and I didn't, I wasn't going to get into it because I knew he was going to argue with me. But I, wanted him to, but I wanted to tell him that's not how God works, amen. God has designed a local independent Baptist church to be where you come and get closer to God and learn the word of God. And then you take that home and apply it in your home, amen. But we've got to draw nigh to God. You want God to help you? You've got to draw nigh. You've got to take that first step. Amen. You've got to get into church. You've got to be there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, as much as possible. You've got to get in your Bible. You've got to pray. You've got to do what it takes to draw nigh to God. Take that first step, and the Bible says, and He will draw nigh to you. Boy, that's a good promise. Amen. You draw nigh to God, God promises that He'll draw nigh to you. Amen. You take God at his word and you say, you know, God, I need you. You know, God, I've, I, I, I've had the fightings, the wars. I have, some, I have lust that I'm consuming upon myself and I'm trying to get a hold of God. My prayers aren't answered. And God says, this is what you do. You draw nigh to me. You mark her down. You'll draw nigh to God. If you'll get a hold of God, if you'll take that first step and be in church, be in a good church that loves you and that preaches the word of God, that God will draw nigh to you in your life. A lot of people are looking for God. A lot of people are looking for God, but they're looking in the wrong place. You draw nigh to God where God's at. And the Bible says, and he'll draw nigh to you. You can't draw nigh to God in a bar. Amen. You can't draw nigh to God at the clubhouse. You draw nigh to God at church. You draw nigh to God in your Bible reading. You draw nigh to God through prayer. You go to God His way. And the Bible says He will draw nigh to you. Amen. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. It's funny, when you draw nigh to God, you get cleansed. Amen. You never stay the same. Amen. You get closer to God, you realize what God wants. The closer you get to God the different you'll become. The closer you get to God, the cleaner you'll become. That's why in church, amen, you, you get closer to the Lord and you hear the preaching about how we ought to clean up our lives, how we ought not to do this and ought not to do that. You know why? That's a result of getting closer to God. Because what it, God says, be holy for I am holy. So he was telling them, listen, you've got wars and fightings among you, but that's because you're so far from God. Amen. You're a friend of the world. You're an enemy of God. God says, you're going to have to draw nigh to me. You're going to have to get back with me. You're going to have to get back on my side. But when you do that, God will clean you up. 
God will purify your hearts. God will cleanse your hands. Amen. You'll be a different person. Then he says, be afflicted and mourn in verse 9 and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. I believe that's talking about his sin. Sin ought to make us mourn, not rejoice. We've got to change our mindset about how we look at our sin. Lust bringeth forth sin, and sin bringeth forth death. We've got to look at sin as a heaviness and not a joy. The world makes a mock at sin, the Bible says. Christians ought not to mock sin, but ought to make us heavy to know that we've sinned against an almighty God. When you look at America and the sin that America's in, it ought to turn you to your knees and say, God, we're in a mess. Amen. When we begin to allow in America the things that have been allowed in this last year, us Christians ought to be afflicted and mourn and weep for our country. But in our own lives, when we allow ourselves to fall into sin, because all of us do, that sin ought to make us mourn and weep and draw us back to God. It should turn our joy to heaviness to know that we've sinned and we need to get it right with God. Amen. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Amen. Back to humbling ourselves. Being humble, coming to God, realizing who we are in front of an almighty God. You know, we're all sinners. Amen. And we definitely don't deserve the grace of God. But thank the Lord for his grace. And it ought to humble us to know that God is willing to give us grace and God is still willing to hear our prayer even though we've sinned. Amen. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. So we see, we saw the root of the problem, lust. We saw the result of the problem. Their prayers, weren't, their prayers were hindered, and they turned to the world. They become an enemy of God. The resolution of the problem is God gives more grace. We're going to have to humble ourselves. We have to draw nigh to God. We have to cleanse our hands, purify our hearts. Amen? And then we've got to let sin become something that makes us sad and not rejoice in iniquity. Now, the revealing of the problem. God reveals in the next few verses symptoms in our lives of lust. I believe that God uses a couple of these things to kind of reveal in our lives some things that we need to humble ourselves and get rid of. Number one, verse 11, Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Amen. We ought not to speak evil one of another. Our tongues ought not to be one that drags people down but edifies. Amen. Our tongues ought... In, in this church there, they had a problem. They had the wars and fightings among them. And, uh, well, not uh, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, excuse me. And they had this problem where they were fighting and, and uh, they were just speaking evil one of another. Amen. Gossiping, backbiting, all of those things. God hates that kind of stuff. The Bible says in Proverbs that God uh, hates those that, di that sow discord among the brethren. Amen. We shouldn't speak evil one of another. Amen. We should, be try, we should try to edify each other in the Word of God. Try to build each other up. Amen. Uh, God says He doesn't want us speaking evil one of another because if we do and we judge our brother, we speak evil of the law and judge at the law. He says, but if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law but a judge. God says just be a doer. Amen. Not a judge. Amen. Don't go around uh, trying to figure out where everybody's wrong and where everybody's messing up. God says you just do the law. And you let God be the judge. Amen. Then we have, there is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Another symptom that we have in the last few verses here of our lives is, and this is a big one, verse 13. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. They were taking their lives into their own hands. 
God has a will for your life, and God has a plan. We ought not to say like they did. They, he said, go to now, ye that say, and this is what they would say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life. They would say, you know, I think I'll go here, I think I'll do this, I think I'll get this job, and I think I'll buy and sell, get gain. And he was trying to tell them, you don't control that. Amen. God controls your life. God knows tomorrow if you're going to live or die. A lot of times we try to say, well, you know, Lord, I'm going to get this job or I'm going to go do this, and we never ask God. And it's a result of pride in our lives that we say, you know, I, I know better than God. Man, every decision that we make, wherever we go, whatever we do, any job we get, anything that we try to achieve, we should pray and ask God for His wisdom. Man, because we don't know what's on tomorrow, because our life is a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Amen. Your life is here for just a little while. Amen. The Bible says it's like a vapor. It shows up and then it's gone. You see it for a little while and then you never see it again. Amen. We ought not to live our lives worrying about where we're going to go or what we're going to do. God will take care of that. Our lives ought to be worried about living for the Lord. Our lives ought to be more worried about winning souls, being in church, reading our Bibles, tithing, serving God, doing what God would have us to do, and God will show us what city to go to. God will show us how long to be there. God will show you what job to get. God will show you how to get what you need. But America is too consumed with jobs and money. They tell you, go where the money's at instead of go where God wants you to go. I know a lot of people that have taken jobs in other places where there's not even a local church. But that's because they said, you know, I'll go here and do this and I'll be fine. I don't need God. God will understand. I've got to make money for my family. God says, you trust Him. Your life's a vapor. It's going to be gone tomorrow. Live your life for the Lord because you don't have long. You don't have a lot of it. It appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. Don't worry about how much money that you're gonna uh, that you that you want to make or how. Uh, don't worry about uh, the job that you you want to have. Let God take care of you. Amen. And that doesn't mean we don't plan for the future, and it doesn't mean that we don't try to earn. Amen. And save. But what it means is we. We, uh, we consult God and we make a decision based on the Word of God, not on ourselves. Because our life is a vapor. It says, For that ye ought to say, verse 15, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If it's God's will, we'll do it. If God wants me to do it, I'll do it. If God wants me to go there, that's what I'll do. If God wants me to get that job, I'll get that job. If God wants me to uh, make that much money, I'll make that much money. It's God's will. Amen? Not ours. But a result of lust in our life is what we, we want what we want. We don't want what God wants. So we go to the world to get what we want. We don't want to do God's will because God's will means we can't have all the money. We can't have all the fame. We can't have all the riches. We can't work on Sunday. We can't do this or that. But God's will is always best. God knows what you need. God knows what is best for you. And in our lives, every decision we make ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall. Amen. That ought to be our motto. If the Lord will, we shall. We're going to do what God wants. Amen. We're going to follow God's leading. And that was their problem. They didn't want to follow God. They didn't want God's will. They wanted their world or their will. Amen. So they became an enemy of God by joining the world and getting what they wanted. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do, God, to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It is a sin to know what you're supposed to do and not do it. God says if you know to do good and doeth it not, 
to him it is sin. If you know you ought to be in church and you don't, then it's sin. If you know you ought to be where, where God wants you to be, if you know what God's will is and you don't do it, God says it's sin. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. A lot of Christians are in sin today because they know what they're supposed to do and they never do it. Amen. So we need to watch for lust. Amen. You're, the lust in our lives can do what it did to these, uh, to, this, to these people where it causes contention. It causes us to turn to the world. It causes us to turn away from God. And it causes us not to be in God's will. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Pray that you bless now the morning service also to follow, Lord. We, uh,